All right, good morning. We're gonna get started here. It's 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Christine Drasher, I am with Cassia, and I'm one of your co-hosts for today's session that is sponsored by Cassia. Today, we're gonna be talking about paying for long-term care with our presenter, Mary Frances Price, and um, just a few housekeeping items that we're going to share with you here before we get started. Uh, we have um, about 100 people signed up for today, which is great. Um, however, that makes it a little bit harder to do questions um, audio with audio. Um, so we are going to be doing questions in our chat room. So we ask that everybody mutes themselves so that we don't have any background noise and um, use the chat feature, which is listed at the bottom of your screen to go ahead and type your questions. And my co-host today, um, Shelly Kruger and Craig McDaniels, also from Cassia, uh, will be moderating the questions through the chat room. As we have breaks throughout the presentation, we'll address those with Mary Frances. Um, we are also going to be sharing with those that are on the uh, presentation today, um, handouts and uh, recording of this session. Um, probably within a couple days of, of today, you should be getting an email from me with that information. So we're going to get started and um, I'm going to pass it on to Shelly, who is going to uh, share a little bit more about uh, Cassia with you. Good morning, everyone. Shelly Krieger here and uh, welcome to the presentation. For those of you unfamiliar with the name Cassia, I'll, I'll just offer a bit of background and context. Augustana Care and Elam Care came together to form Cassia in 2018 with a combined 215 years of experience providing housing, healthcare, and community-based services to older adults. Cassia offers services in Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Residents, patients, and clients can find independent and assisted living communities, memory support, care suites, adult day services, rehabilitation, and skilled nursing at Cassia. We are grateful and have the privilege of serving approximately 9,000 people in senior housing and skilled care. Uh, please note that location guide that you saw on the previous slide will be included with the slide deck that's emailed to you. Cassia partners in ownership with independent service providers such as Centrix Rehab, Pro Rehab, Grace Hospice, and Guardian Angels Home Care and Hospice. Cassia owns additional service lines, positioning our organization to be uh, truly a, a full service provider, uh, kind of a, a one-stop shop, if you will. Additional service lines include our A&E Pharmacy uh, Medical Supply Company, called Elam Preferred Services, and assistive technologies through the Cassia Learning Lab. So we're pleased to be uh, partnered with or, and or owning uh, all of these different service lines. And I'll pass that on to Craig. Thanks, Shelley. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the presentation today. Um, you know, paying for long-term care can be a real challenge, and, and this pr presentation is just rich with content. Um, we want you to know that part of our mission here at Cassia uh, is really to provide a variety of payment options. And as you see on the screen there, um, there are some payers that we just want you to be aware of. Uh, we do accept uh, HUD Section 8, um, EW, or Elderly Waiver, uh, formerly GRH, it's now called Housing Support Payment Rates, um, Medicaid, of course, you hear that as MA, and private pay. Uh, what you'd want to do, though, is if you are looking to place uh, a client or a loved one, uh, as you do your research, you'd want to reach out to CassiaLife.org and then look for a community of your choice. Uh, reach out to that marketing or housing director and if there's a payment option that you're, you see on the screen here, you'd want to talk to them specifically to find out if uh, they accept that payer. Not all of our communities do, uh, but some do. Uh, next slide. And then uh, we had part one, 
a couple weeks back. If you did not receive information on that, uh, Christine had alluded to this earlier, you can email her uh, at Christine Drasher at CassiaLife.org and she'll get you that information from part one if you did not receive that. And then um, if you haven't had a chance uh, to sign up for part three in this series, we have the Veterans Benefit coming up on August 5th. Um, so be aware of that and uh, um, you'll get information here uh, to sign up um, for that uh, event as well. So with that, I'll pass it back to Christine. Oops, all right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna um, introduce our speaker for today, Mary Frances Price with Long Rear Hansen and Price. Um, Mary Frances has uh, worked with Cassia and other uh, communities to provide some great education opportunities. She's an expert in her field. She really focuses on practicing and serving individuals and families who are establishing an estate plan, revising an existing estate plan, or dealing with legal, medical, or financial impacts of aging, chronic illness, and disability. She has been accredited to practice before the Department of Veterans Affairs since 2008. And since then, she has counseled and advised veterans and their families on assessing state and federal VA benefits. Um, we are excited to have her today. I learn something new every time she speaks. Um, and um, I think you will too. So let's please welcome Mary Frances. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Christine, Shelley, and Craig for sponsoring this important event. Um, we've been partnering together for more than a decade um, to provide education to the community on issues um, related to long-term care. And of course, with COVID, our platform has shifted a little bit, but we're really pleased that each of you is um, willing to join us on our new platform so that we can continue to learn together. So our topic today is paying for long-term care. Um, this is something I spend a lot of, of my week helping people understand um, how it relates to them. Um, so first, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of understanding what the term long-term care means. Um, so looking at the definition from Medicare.gov, um, long-term care is really um, a range of services. I like to think of it as, um, and Christine, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, so long-term care is really a range of services that somebody may need in order to support their personal care needs. So I think of this as if, if somebody wants to live at home independently, what are the essential things that somebody needs to be able to do um, either by themselves or with support. And so um, these essential activities of daily living, you may be familiar with that term. Um, this is the measure uh, by which the medical community determines if somebody has clinical needs um, for support with their activities of daily living. So we're looking at things like ability to bathe somebody self, um, to get dressed, to use the bathroom. Um, to transfer, you know, from, from the bed to a standing position or from a standing position to a chair. Um, continence, and then of course, being able to feed um, yourself or eat. There's also something called instrumental activities of daily living. That would include things like using the telephone or setting up medications. And those are also important tasks that particularly around memory loss, we might, see this, we might start to see changes in somebody's ability to manage their instrumental activities of daily living. And then it may progress to the point where they're needing support around these essential activities of daily living. So again, when I use the word or the term long-term care, what I'm talking about are these essential activities that somebody is supposed to be able to manage with or without support in order to maintain living in the community. Um, and so how does that, what does, you know, how, how does that impact our benefits? Well, Medicare and long-term care insurance and um, other regulated benefits will use activities of daily living as a measure of whether or not somebody is in need of long-term care. So you may hear something like, 
oh, you need to have, if you qualify for coverage under this long-term care benefit, if you need support with three or more of your activities of daily living. So this is um, the way that the long-term care community measures whether or not somebody is in need of long-term care. Where it gets confusing is that routine medical insurance in general does not contemplate covering long-term care expenses for a long time, for a protracted period into the future. But as you're gonna to learn today, Medicare and other um, health insurance may have a limited long-term care benefit. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about what, is, what exactly you know, is long-term care, what do you mean by that? Um, I wanted to just put together a list for you of where we're going today and also two weeks from today in terms of veterans benefits. Because a common question I get from families is, um, how am I going to pay for long-term care? If Medicare, if my insurance doesn't cover it, then how am I going to pay for this care, which can be quite significant um, if it's expected to be out of pocket? So here's our roadmap. Um, there, as I said, there's a limited long-term care benefit under Medicare and the, your Medicare supplement that we're going to review today. Um, people pay privately. Some people have the ability with their income, their pension, their Social Security, maybe their retirement um, savings. Some people pay privately um, for a long period of time. Some people have that ability for a lesser period of time. And then after a certain amount of months or years, they're going to need some help with paying for care. Um, Long-term care insurance. This is a privately sold product. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this today. Um, this is one of those tools in the toolkit that if it's available to somebody, then it would be part of their plan to pay for long-term care. Veterans benefits, that's something we'll go in depth on two weeks from today. So if that's a topic of interest to you, I'd ask you to come back and join us. I won't be talking about that today, but it is something that can be a game changer for a lot of families. And it's something that's often overlooked um, in the context of building a budget or a plan to pay for long-term care. And of course, lastly, I've listed Medicaid. Um, that is a federal term. In Minnesota, we call Medicaid Medical Assistance, or MA. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time looking at that program today to help you better understand who qualifies and when and how they qualify. So first, let's take a look. Here's an example for you. So let's, let's uh, picture Bob and Ruth, they're living at home in their longtime home in South Minneapolis, and Bob has some advancing dementia, and Ruth is his primary caregiver, and she is managing a lot of tasks related to running the household in addition to preparing meals, um, supervising Bob, attending to his needs as his memory is changing over time, but recently she fell and fractured her hip. And um, as a result of that, she went to the hospital where she was admitted and received um, a new hip. And after that, she was going to be transferred to rehab um, where she will stay for probably a couple months and learn how to function with her new hip. So if you think about that episode for Ruth, she has a fall on day one. She's transferred to the hospital. She's there for three days. Um, to receive her new hip. And after that three days, she goes to, um, is transferred to a rehab facility. So if you think about that episode, um, days one through 20, she would receive full coverage um, under her Medicare benefit for the long-term care services she'll be receiving when she's in rehab. So um, after that, she'll be eligible to receive up to an additional 21 through up to 100 days um, that will be covered at a lesser percent and that's where her medicare supplement would um, likely provide an additional benefit um, but in any event the medicare benefit alone would not provide full coverage it would provide about 80 percent and then her supplement's gonna um, make a contribution as well so um, I say up to 100 days because that 100 days is not guaranteed to Ruth. As she's going through her rehab, um, she'll need to be hitting certain markers in order to continue being certified for Medicare qualified 
coverage while she's in rehab. Um, so, but while she's in rehab, she'll be receiving occupational and physical therapy services, which are considered long-term care services. So this is where Medicare does have some long-term care coverage. However, the whole intention or plan design behind the Medicare long-term care benefit is to get Ruth healthy and stable enough to go back home and resume independent living. So if, let's say, Ruth in the course of her rehab um, started to have um, some setbacks, she developed a UTI, she started with the medications and the fatigue from the, from the injury and the physical therapies, she started to develop her own um, cognitive challenges and her providers have a care conference with the family and sit them down and say, in the middle of this 21 through 100 day period, we do not see Ruth regaining independence to the point where she would need to be in order to transition home safely without a significant level of support. So if that were happening, there's a shift where this is no longer long-term care services to try and get her rehabbed to get home. If, there's a, a, if there were a shift in her care where it appeared as though um, the therapy services were not going to get her to that point of independence where she could manage her ADLs and return home safely, then it, that would be a situation where the Medicare qualified stay would likely end, and then it would shift into more of a private pay scenario. Um, and that's where, as you might imagine, a lot of families are shocked and panicked because they go from having um, some amount of contribution, like a co-insurance obligation to, um, you know, a three or four hundred dollar a day obligation um, through private pay. So that's a point at which a lot of where Medicare long term care benefits would cease and then it would shift into a longer term um, need. So when you think about your Medicare uh, long term care benefit, you want to think about it in terms of it's the type of long-term care services that are intended to help somebody transition back to um, the highest level of independent living that they are going to be capable of. And that could be, you know, Ruth and Bob's home in South Minneapolis. That could be an assisted living apartment in a community. So um, it's not necessarily at home. It's wherever that patient's home was. Um, but where, where Medicare is going to drop off and private pay is going to pick up is when it's a type of need that is expected to go on indefinitely into the future. Then you're going to see those Medicare long-term care services um, likely terminate. Um, so I touched on the supplement. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, we're coming up on the open enrollment period. If you haven't started to get an onslaught of emails and mail solicitations, you probably will if you're a Medicare beneficiary. Um, this is the time of year where many people will be reviewing their supplemental insurance. Um, in the last several years, we've seen a huge push towards um, uh, advantage plans. So people have been shuffling their plans around a bit. Um, so in any event, I think um, most people are learning that your Medicare supplement um, can be important in terms of what does it cover, what does it not cover, um, where do I see, receive my care, do I spend winters in Arizona, um, what type of medications do I take. All of these variables might influence which supplemental uh, plan is best for you, and that's why it is good to get some guidance and information on your Medicare supplement. Um, you know, in uh, general, reimbursement through a supplemental plan is pretty highly regulated. Um, nonetheless, it, it does make sense to have a, a Medicare supplement for most people, um, so that's something you want to be sure to be thinking about as we enter the open enrollment period. So, um, so let's, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. and We're going to start looking at medical assistance. So if you think about my list of um, resources for how do people pay for long-term care, um, we've talked about Medicare with a limited benefit. Private pay kind of speaks for itself, right? That's your, the use of your income and, and retirement savings um, to put together a plan to pay for care. 
but for most families um, that are facing you know significant long-term care expenses over a longer period of time they may be looking at i have the ability to pay privately for some period of time that could be three months two years um, but then at some point, they, there may be the need for some additional support to help pay for those expenses if they're ongoing. So that's where the medical assistance programs co comes in. Um, so here, Medicaid is a federal term. So remember, Medicare is your primary health insurance if you're over 65. Medicaid is a federal entitlement program um, that's available to individuals who meet the eligibility criteria. So the legal basis for this Medicaid program is actually rooted in federal law. It was first enacted in 1965 as part of the original Social Security Act. So in, in the mid 60s, if you just think about what was happening in terms of the United States, and there was a pretty significant cultural shift away from a more um, rural, small town, scenario where traditionally many families would take care of their elders in their own homes. And as you progressed into the 60s, more people were leaving small towns, going to cities, um, going to college, um, living in more densely populated cities. And there was also this idea that um, some of our elders, instead of being able to care for them at home because more people were going into um, a, the workforce, that we had this need for having um, skilled nursing available to support the needs of elders in our community. And along with that, there was the question of who's gonna pay for it. So what's interesting is when you start thinking about Medicaid and when it was enacted, and if you think about some of the, I think we've all been into skilled nursing homes, right? Um, I had a relative lived to be 105 years old who was living in a nursing home for 25 years in central Indiana. And I remember, going and visiting her three times a year as a family. And I think about that building. And when I started to learn, oh, Medicaid was um, first uh, uh, enacted in 1965, that's probably around the time that the building was built that I have seared in my mind. So, and that's true of many nursing facilities that I've been in through the years. And I think that many of you might agree. So you think, okay, so that's when this was starting to become a thing. We were um, building hospital-like structures in order to support um, elders in our community and their need to receive skilled nursing care as they were aging because we were no longer doing that at home. So what happens here is Medicaid is a federal program. Every state is um, allowed to take the broad guidelines under that rule and then figure out how they're going to employ um, the Medicaid program in their own state. So, um, you know, I've given you a citation here to the statute for Minnesota. Every state has their own body of law that takes the federal law and puts it into their own state law. Um, so we have a, a statute in Minnesota that governs eligibility for medical assistance and each state does vary a little bit in its implementation of the program. Um, I've also given you a reference here to something called the Minnesota Healthcare Programs Manual, which is not law, but it is what the county caseworkers use to make decisions about eligibility and administration of a program. So it does help inform how decisions are made about who qualifies for medical assistance in Minnesota and um, the eligibility rules. So um, again, state the Medicaid um, is paid for by both the state and federal government. Each individual state administers their program. Eligibility criteria does differ from state to state. So if you know, if you're in North Dakota, if you're in Wisconsin, if you're in Florida, um, some of what I'm talking about will be consistent across states. Um, other things may be unique in the state. Some of this is developed by state law litigation. Um, so you do want to develop an understanding of um, how Medicaid works in your state. Um, waivers are something that differ widely from state to state. So I'm going to talk in particular today about the elderly waiver, um, and that will be very specific to Minnesota. So um, in our Medicaid program in Minnesota, programs are broken up into two broad 
categories based on age. So we look at is the individual under age 65 or over age 65? And that may inform us which, what the menu of options is for that particular um, person that's seeking assistance. Um, for today's purposes, I'm really focusing on the over 65 programs, in particular, um, medical assistance for elderly waiver and medical assistance for long-term care. I just wanted to, I put this slide on there just so you get this understanding that medical assistance is kind of a very broad umbrella term. And then underneath that, we have these different programs to address the needs of specific populations. So um, for example, medical assistance, EPD for employed persons with disability is a different form of medical assistance for somebody who may be in need of assistance, but has the ability to work um, at some capacity. Um, but may have some significant support needs. Um, so there are lots of different programs depending on what the needs are of the particular individual. So um, in general, programs are also separated by where somebody is living. So, you know, if I'm thinking about Bob and Ruth, and let's say that um, they need to transition out of their home um, to go to assisted living, um, that is considered community-based care in Minnesota. So the way our regulation and law, like our body of law has evolved is Minnesota recognizes that there's something called housing with services. Um, that would include things like um, assisted living, memory care, um, group homes. Uh, that would also include something like somebody's living in their home and they bring in some medical assistance support while they're living in their home. Um, so in any event, when we talk about community-based long-term care, what we're talking about is essentially anything other than a nursing home, okay? And so the technical term is housing with services. Um, and this, in this arena, it's very common for the housing provider in the example of like an assisted living, we'll have one contract for the housing, like you're going to rent this room and there would be a completely separate contract for services. And that kind of makes sense because if you're renting the room that has, is a studio and has, you know, 500 square feet, then you're going to pay the same amount as the person in the room next door with the same square footage and amenities, because that is, reimbursement just for the physical space. The services, however, are directly correlated to um, the individual needs of the resident. So you'll see many communities have um, levels of care and they'll screen people on admission and then they'll continually screen people at different intervals to determine what the appropriate level of care is. So as you might imagine, the more care that a resident needs, uh, typically, um, that means it's going to be a higher cost of care. So it is very common, it is standard practice when you're evaluating assisted living, um, you know, group residential housing, uh, memory care communities, that you would be asked to review one contract for rent and one contract for services, understanding that the services portion is variable and will likely change over time particularly if you're dealing with a progressive condition that's likely to require enhanced or increased levels of care um, over the course of time. So um, elderly waiver, as an example, is a waiver program that would reimburse for the services portion of somebody's stay in assisted living, but it does not provide coverage for the rent. So that is handled under a different program um, and so there are details that you'd want to be mindful of if you are seeking medical assistance um, support. We'll, we're going to talk through some more details about that. But at first, I just want you to understand that there's this distinction between living in the community, that includes assisted living memory care, and skilled nursing care. So skilled nursing care is that um, traditional nursing home setting that I was referring to it, my, my Aunt Ellen who lived to be 105 in central Indiana in a skilled nursing home. And that was the type of thing where you walk in the door and it feels very hospital-like. Um, individual rooms, shared rooms, um, maybe some common congregate spaces for 
dining or activities. Um, but in any event, it feels a little more institutional, more like a hospital. That's the traditional skilled nursing home setting. Um, as you might imagine, since we talked about this, touched on this earlier, we've had Medicaid reimbursement for skilled nursing facilities since 1965. So we have a very well-developed body of federal and state law on how the Medicaid program is administered as it relates to skilled nursing homes. We do not have that same body of law developed or regulation for community-based care because community-based care is relatively new. The first assisted living community was established in the Portland, Oregon area in the mid 90s. And so if you think about that, like the early to mid 90s, this concept of community-based care was evolving and has continued to evolve because as you might imagine, some of you have heard me say this before probably, in all my years of elder law practice, I have never once had anybody call me and say, Mary Frances, I'm here because I want you to help me get into the nursing home. In fact, most people, are trying to live in the least restrictive setting for as long as possible. And so the advent of assisted living nursing homes, community care was recognizing that as people are aging, they prefer to be in a home-like setting. And so um, that is a phenomenon. These communities we see going up all over our, um, our community being developed is in response to the fact that that's what the market really wants. People don't want to go to a nursing home. They prefer to be in a more home-like setting. But the consequence of that is with the way this licensure works is we don't have as much regulation or rules or guidance around how to implement the Medicaid program as it relates to community-based care. So I'm just letting you know that because as if you're a consumer looking at the different choices, it's really important to understand if Medicaid is part of your story, um, that there are significant differences in the way that program is managed or administered um, with community-based care. One of the other reasons that skilled nursing facilities, we actually have a moratorium in Minnesota, meaning we cannot develop anymore. So in fact, we're losing nursing home beds. And you might think, how can that be at a time where we have an aging population? Well, it's because this is the most expensive uh, point or delivery of care. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, it, you don't really um, go to skilled nursing care unless you meet the clinical criteria for that level of care, right? So it's um, what we're doing, or what we're seeing is people are coming up with um, alternate options to provide supportive care that's less restrictive, less hospital-like, less nursing home-like um, for a lot of reasons, which include um, reimbursement, um, patient preference, and so on. So let's take a little bit closer look at this uh, medical assistance elderly waiver. Um, uh, Mary Francis, Mary Fr yes. excuse me. We, we have a question in the group chat. Can we pause okay. here for you to take this one? Sure. Yeah, great, here's the question. If one is already in a long-term care facility and is injured, requiring hospitalization, could she receive Medicare medical supplement benefits if her rehab occurred at the long-term care facility? So if I'm understanding correctly, if somebody is, it, it would depend on whether or not the person suffered the injury at the time they were on a Medicare qualified stay, or if they were in a long-term care facility um, as a private pay resident. So um, the, it, it depends, um, but you may, um, you, some of you may be familiar with the concept that um, Medicare coverage is regulated for the same diagnosis code so what that means is if somebody has an event requiring rehab and they have maxed out their 100 days and then they have a readmission within a certain amount of time for the same diagnosis code, there may be limited or no coverage for that second event. Um, so this is a question that is not easily answered without knowing a lot more about uh, the circumstances surrounding that situation, but what I would say is um, a good resource for um, families 
and Consumers is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Advocacy website. Um, so if you have more questions around what does Medicare cover or not cover under these certain circumstances, I would say that would be a good resource for you to do some additional um, looking at what um, in this circumstance might be the case. But that is probably a little more involved than I can get into right at this moment, but a very good and important question, which I think underscores that, you know, Medicare um, has a lot of rules and sometimes it's really hard for families um, in real time to understand and know when you're navigating hospitalizations and rehab, um, what is covered and what is not. So again, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Advocacy is a tremendous resource for both lawyers and um, non-lawyers that um, might be of some use to you in investigating that. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have at the moment. And to the group, please continue to use the group chat uh, and, and, and uh, type in your questions as we go along. So taking a closer look at medical assistance elderly waiver, and again, to orient you, this is the program, the medical assistance program in the state of Minnesota that helps reimburse for um, long-term care services received by a resident in a community care setting. Community care setting could be somebody's home where they bring caregivers into the home. It could be an assisted living community, group residential housing, um, a memory care facility. So again, we're talking about the medical assistance program that reimburses for care in a community-based setting. Now, if we're dealing with a single person, uh, medical assistance, elderly waiver, and community care requires a determination of clinical need. And the way this is handled by our state is um, you have to undergo something called a MIN choice, MN choice assessment. And this would be administered by um, social workers and um, nurses, pub public health workers in the county of residence. So if somebody's living in Hennepin County and they are thinking of applying for MAEW, they would need to contact the county, request an assessment. The assessment would be made um, in, before COVID, the assessments were um, handled in person. Um, now they're doing things a little differently in light of COVID and reducing risks. But the idea is that there would be a meeting um, to meet with the um, patient resident and maybe some, some of their caregiver partners or family members um, to determine what their level of care needs are. Um, and it will be you know, directly correlated to what the underlying health circumstances are. And again, think of it as somebody looking at what is this person's need for support with those activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, feeding themselves. So that's what this assessment's all about. What is the appropriate level of care to make sure that this person can live in the community setting and be safe and healthy? Um, uh, by Minnesota law, that screening is valid for 60 days. So timing is really important when you're contemplating an application for medical assistance EW benefits because essentially that assessment um, gets stale after 60 days and may need to be re, um, a, there may need to be a new assessment in which case you've lost the potential of coverage for the previous um, 60 day period. So again, um, important to establish the clinical need and to make sure that you understand that the timing of that in light of when you apply for medical assistance is important. And where it can, like I just worked with a family recently that went through and had a, an assessment by Hennepin County only to find out, oh, we're, we're not financially eligible. So clinically, there was a person who met the clinical requirements. However, looking at the financial criteria, they were over um, the eligibility for financial. For a single person to be eligible, for medical assistance elderly waiver, they have to have reduced available assets to 3,000 or less. Um, and so, and their need for services has to exceed their income. So if I have, you know, somebody who is a retired teacher and has a nice pension, and they only, under their min choice assessment, let's say their pension is $2,500 a month, but they're screened and it's determined they need about $600 worth of supportive services, 
well, that's less than their income. And so they would not qualify financially because um, their need for services has to exceed their income. Um, so again, understanding the financial criteria is as important as making sure you have the clinical determination in place before being, those two things have to come together within a certain amount of time in order for a proper eligibility determination. So for married persons, it looks a little different, right? We still have, if you think about Bob and Ruth, and let's say Bob with his advancing dementia um, needs to be screened for potentially um, receiving some MAEW services, they would have to do the min choice assessment just like the single person, but the financial criteria looks a little bit different. Bob, in my example, would be allowed to keep 3,000 in available assets. And then Ruth, as his spouse, his well spouse, would be able to keep up to 128,640. That number is our 2020 number. This number changes every January. Um, and then of course, there's no limit on exempt assets. And for those of you who are always thinking three steps ahead, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you what's available and what's exempt, that's coming up. Um, so I'm noticing, was there another question, Craig? There is, okay. yes. Are you ready for this one? I'm ready. All right, uh, what to do if one spouse has dementia and 21-year-old long-term care policy wouldn't cover full monthly expenses for a nursing home? Uh, looks like regarding a five-year look back, uh, Medicaid revocable or irrevocable trust so as not to lose home, etc. So um, lots of different issues embedded in there. Um, I think some of it may be covered as we continue the conversation about the Medicaid program broadly, but um, you know, I'd be curious. Oh, so the long-term care policy. Let's do this. Um, the, I can circle back to this question after we get through some more of the content, because I think some of these questions will be answered. But um, we will come back to you, Faye and Jim, to double check and see if, that, if, if your answers have been received throughout the course of the conversation, if you're okay with that. Um, so let's move to MA, um, continuing the conversation about MAEW. Um, Craig touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, I think that you want to really understand that just because you might be clinically and financially eligible for elderly waiver, meaning the county can say, yes, uh, Bob meets the financial and clinical criteria for elderly waiver coverage, but he may have, uh, his, his family may have identified a community that's three blocks from their house that has a policy that they don't accept elderly waiver, or maybe they do, but they, um, they prefer that their residents pay privately for some period of time, maybe 18, 24, 36 months of private pay, and then they'd accept a resident on the waiver. So just because you're eligible clinically and financially by the county does not guarantee that your housing provider it has a contract for EW or accepts residents right in the door on EW. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. If it's a situation where somebody is trying to access um, memory and or assisted living um, support immediately on EW, you really need to be sure you're working with your prospective facilities to understand what is your policy, when would we be eligible, um, and make sure that you're developing your plan around what the understanding of the housing provider is and collaborating to make sure you understand um, that you don't get yourself in a situation where you have to move somebody because they don't have an available elderly waiver spot or they don't accept that as a payer source. Um, remember EW reimburses for the services side. Remember that we have the the one contract for rent and the contract for services, EW is for the services. Um, the resident may also need to apply for some additional what's called housing supports to help pay for that rent portion. Um, in recent years, um, many communities are 
Um, also coming up with creative ways. If a spouse, like in my example, if Ruth is gonna live at home and she's got that nice teacher's pension and Bob is going, needing to move into memory care, um, and some providers will say, we will accept Bob on EW for services, but we really need some extra help to pay for rent. And Ruth may decide within her budget, okay, I can, I can make an additional contribution for that because I have sufficient income and some excess. Um, so again, really trying to develop an understanding with your housing provider what the expectation is on reimbursement is imperative if you're thinking about applying for a Medicaid program. Um, so that is the broad overview for how coverage happens in community-based care. Now we're gonna shift gears and look at what it looks like in the nursing home setting. Remember, this is skilled um, nursing care. So for a single person, it's pretty straightforward. One of the big differences with skilled care is that you don't have to go through that min choice assessment to screen. Why? Because the clinical need is established by a physician order. The physician orders that the patient is in need of a skilled level of care. So there's no um, need to do the level of care assessment because the physician has essentially already deemed that person in need of skilled nursing care. From a financial perspective, it's the same as EW. The um, person seeking coverage can have no more than 3,000 in available assets. Um, for a married person, again, no clinical need established by physician order, but the financial criteria looks a little different. I see I have a typo on line three. It should say 128,640, um, just like it did on the previous slide. Um, 126 was the 2019 number. We've updated, okay, to 128,640, which just means that, again, in my example, if Bob's going to go into the nursing home and Ruth is going to stay at home, Ruth gets to keep up to 128,640 of available assets and any amount of exempt assets. So, the moment you've all been waiting for. What is considered an available or exempt or unavailable asset? In Medicaid lingo, there are three types of assets, okay? Available, unavailable, and exempt. Available assets are anything that is not exempt, which might include checking, so checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, bonds, anything at the bank, brokerage and investment accounts, any and all retirement accounts, regardless of which spouse's name is on them, um, would be considered available, including 401k, IRA, SEP, any type of annuities. Um, second properties, so you know somebody who has a condo in Arizona or a cabin in Wisconsin, the, you do get an exemption for a primary homestead, but any um, extra properties would be considered available. Um, recreational vehicles, snowmobiles, boats, more than one car, and then um, things like life insurance with a cash surrender value. Sometimes that's overlooked because we think of life insurance as something that pays out at death, but certain types of life insurance carry cash value, and that cash value would be considered part of the available asset pool when we're looking at medical assistance eligibility. So exempt assets, um, exempt assets include um, a person's primary homestead with an equity cap of 585 in Minnesota. That's one of those numbers that differs from state to state. It's lower in some states, it's higher in other states. Um, so there's an example of where um, the federal Medicaid law, I think provides an exemption for up to 865,000 of equity but then each state gets to figure out what's, what's a sensible exemption level for a homestead in our state. Minnesota has chosen 585. As you might suspect, states like California and New York have a higher home equity exemption. Um, for elderly waiver applicants, um, the home is only exempt if the applicant is living in the home. So it is possible to be living, think of Bob and Ruth living in their home in South Minneapolis. One option would be to apply for medical assistance, elderly waiver services at home, in which case the equity in the home would be considered exempt. 
If, however, it's a single person who's moved into memory care and has their home, that home would be considered available. And um, so there are some, you know, exceptions. Sometimes people go into a long-term care setting and are receiving rehab, but it, they may be expected to, it's, it, there's a possibility they'd return home within six months, in which case, their home could remain exempt and they could receive some assistance paying for care if there's a possibility they could return home. Once there's no longer a possibility for that person to return home in the opinion of their physician, then they have to be making reasonable efforts to prep that house for sale. So you do get some exemption, some limited exemption around a house that's pending sale if somebody's transitioned to the nursing home, you can still receive medical assistance while you're prepping that house for sale. In any event, if you're in that circumstance, you wanna be sure to fully understand what the rules are as it relates to that, that home exemption. So house one automobile, um, you know, sometimes I have people with multiple automobiles and they're trying to decide, um, they may take the highest value car and say, that's my exempt, car and they may take a lower value car and apply that towards their 128 640. So it's not that you can't have more than one car, it's just that one car is considered exempt. Um, prepaid burial plans or cremation plans that are in a properly structured Medicaid qualifying burial plan would be considered exempt without limitation. Um, there are also some interesting rules that allow people to, to purchase funeral and burial space items, not only for you know, Bob and Ruth, but Bob and Ruth could for their children as well. So a family plot and other funeral and burial space items. So I've had some people um, as part of a spend down strategy, um, you know, it's pretty routine to fund uh, cremation and burial for the Bob and Ruth of, of the circumstances, but sometimes they even want to extend that and that is permissible under our Medicaid law. Personal property, including, including things like clothing, jewelry, personal effects, are typically considered exempt. They're not going to come in and make you pay, uh, you know, take your engagement ring and sell it to pay for nursing home care. Um, having said that, if there was some sort of high value art that could be considered a collectible item, that might be treated differently. Um, and I literally never had that circumstance, but that's one that comes to mind as a possibility. Um, Medicaid qualifying annuities, uh, this is something that people like a Bob and Ruth may purchase uh, if Ruth is going to continue living at home and they have a spend down, um, she, Ruth may choose to um, convert available assets into an exempt or unavailable income stream by purchasing an annuity. We'll take a look at how that might work um, in a more specific example. And also property that is in a properly structured special needs trust would also be considered exempt or unavailable. Um, so unavailable assets would be things like, you know, sometimes people are, um, have been told, oh, you are the beneficiary of an estate, but it's tied up in probate or there's a pending trust administration. So you are going to get $50,000 but it could be in six to 18 months because the estate is in process. So you have to disclose that the existence of that interest when you apply for medical assistance, but if you don't have it, it if you don't have access to it, then it's not going to stop you from getting coverage under medical assistance. Another example of unavailable would be if you co-own a cabin property with one or more siblings, and the joint owner refuses to sell, um, then that type of property may be deemed unavailable. You have to report that it exists. It won't prevent you from getting some medical assistance help, but there's a legal reason why you can't get your equity out of the property, and that would be considered unavailable. And also any property tied up in a pending legal action. What happens when um, unavailable assets become available is um, the medical assistance recipient needs to report the, um, the existence of the asset that is now available within 10 days. And to the extent it's in excess of $3,000 and hasn't been spent down, um, then it may terminate medical assistance benefits. In any event, there is this third category that still recognizes that people may have an interest in something, but they don't have 
their ability to get it, and that is what would be considered unavailable. Mary Francis, a couple yeah. of questions have come in. Uh, the first one, when you finally get the money, do you have to repay what medical assistance has already paid for your care? So um, good question. What we're talking about here is if somebody, let's say, has a home and it's pending sale and they are on medical assistance, the question is, once the house sells and the proceeds distribute, medical assistance would be terminated. If that person had received, say, 20,000 of benefits up to that point, must they repay at that moment? Um, we are finding some variation in the administration of the program. And in some cases, we have observed where the county would expect that. In other cases, we have observed where the county would not. In any event, if even if they did not seek re immediate recovery, um, then it would be uh, recoverable against the estate of the medical assistance recipient at death or their spouse's estate. Um, so that's, um, it depends. It depends. We've, our office has seen it both ways. Um, but, you know, there is some basis for the county being able to seek recovery of um, medical assistance paid. Um, okay, another, another question. Uh, would musical instruments be exempt that are worth $1,000? Also, think, would gold or silver be exempt? Um, I think with the musical instruments, you're likely to see that would be considered um, exempt personal property. Um, although I've had uh, people with, you know, pianos that are worth, you know, over $50,000 and that's considered um, an available asset. Uh, gold and silver would not. So if you have gold bars or silver, something like that, that would be considered available. If it's like um, jewelry, you know, mom's engagement and wedding ring, you know, typically, even if it's a $30,000 ring, that's not um, considered available. So um, in my experience, most musical instruments, with the exception of, as I said, really high value pianos, um, are considered exempt. So um, now, you know, the way lawyers work, which drives people crazy for a lot of reasons, right? We drive people crazy, but um, we give you the sort of basic rule. This is the general rule. And after we tell you the general rule and you think you have an understanding of how things work, then we start talking about some of the exceptions. So in general, right, there's no um, exception for giving property away within five years before you apply for medical assistance, except there are some um, cases where it's allowed. Um, one is called the two-year caregiver rule. This is a rule under federal and state law that says if a child or grandchild moves into the home of somebody who needs support with their long-term care needs, and that person provides support that for the two years leading up to the medical assistance application, um, had prevented that person from seeking medical assistance at an earlier date and time, has to be certified by a physician. Um, but in any event, the, that person, the child who has provided the care, can receive the house as a gift. Um, if it's a grandchild, they can have a life estate in the house, meaning they can live in that house for the duration of their life. Um, and it can be grant that life estate interest can be granted by the person applying for medical assistance. And in any event, those two gifts are not um, considered disqualifying gifts that would trigger a period of ineligibility, um, recognizing that um, the person has moved into the house and provided care that, but for that care, the person would have applied for Medicaid two years earlier. Um, there's also an exception for disabled children. So um, this could be a child who's developed um, MS in their 40s and 50s and is now disabled, receiving social security disability, um, parent can give gifts to a disabled child, a child who has a disability certified by the Social Security Administration um, without penalty. Um, if there are siblings who co-own a home and one sibling needs care and the other sibling will remain living in the home, then the half interest in the home can be transferred to the sibling without penalty. 
Um, there's no penalty for transferring property between spouses um, living in the same house, children under age 21 or children with a disability of any age. Um, so, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, am I allowed to transfer this money to, like, if you think about Bob and Ruth, and let's say Bob had some stocks from his employer in his name, and he wants to put them in Ruth's name because he can only have 3000 in his name and apply for medical assistance. No penalty for transferring assets between spouses. Why? Well, because you have to report the existence of all of the marital assets at the time you apply. So you're just shifting um, the ownership from the spouse who's going to apply for care to the well spouse who's going to continue living in the community. There's also something called an undue hardship waiver. That's where there may have been a circumstance where, let's say, somebody was the victim of financial abuse um, and somebody stole money from them or you know, um, coerced them into making gifts. Um, and then, then they later need medical assistance, and that was a gift that would have triggered a penalty. But under the circumstances, um, you know, if, it, if, if it's warranted, then the county has the latitude to grant undue hardships. But I'll tell you, in my experience, they are very sparingly granted, and it's usually cases with egregious facts, like the one I described, where somebody's taken advantage of. Um, so in other words, that's not something to rely on. I wouldn't uh, pay for a granddaughter's private school tuition for a bunch of years and then try and get an undue hardship waiver. That's not the type of facts that the county might be sympathetic to. Um, so I, I alluded to this earlier, medical assistance, for purposes of applying for medical assistance, when somebody applies, they are asked, have you made any gifts or given property away for less than what it's worth, meaning you didn't receive fair market value in return. And um, so that's, we call that a gift, a transfer, giving something away to someone for less than what it's worth. That all means the same thing. Um, and when you apply for medical assistance, the county will ask, have you given anything away? And um, within the previous five years leading up to the day you're applying, and if you have, um, it would be, you know, fraud to not disclose the existence of a gift. Now, if you are paying a child who's helping provide care to you, and they provide care, and it's reasonably compensated, that's not a gift, okay? That is compensation for services. Um, so you want to be really careful about what is a gift. A gift is, you know, I wrote a check to $25,000 to my son because he was going through a divorce and I didn't get it anything back in return. Um, I did that because I love him and I wanted to help him. And it might've been a really good reason. It could even be, you know, I made a pledge to the foundation at church and I gave him $30,000. That would still be considered a gift that would not be permissible and may trigger a penalty. Um, the penalty is always assessed at the time of application. Currently, um, the, what we call the statewide average scaled nursing home rate, that's the fancy way of saying Minnesota decides each year what they think the average cost of nursing home care is. Currently, the number is $8,086. And that's also the number that's used to determine what a penalty period would be when somebody has made an intentional gift transfer. So my example is, if somebody gives $50,000 away in the five years leading up to the medical assistance application and they disclose it, we divide that 50,000 by the 8,086 and that would result in a 6.18 month period of ineligibility. In other words, the county will not pay for the resident for 6.18 months because they're being penalized for having made the gift. So that's how um, it works when things have been gifted or given away in the five years leading up to a medical assistance application. So let's look at some examples. Uh, my first example is um, a skilled nursing care example. So if we have Bob and Ruth have a house worth $400,000, we know that's exempt if, if, you know, if Ruth is gonna continue living there, that 400,000 is exempt, it's less than the 585, okay? Cash and investments of 250,000, all available. Life insurance with cash value, 50,000, available. Income of Ruth, $1,000 a month, unavailable. She gets to keep all that. Bob has $2,500 worth of income each month, um, and he's in need of skilled nursing care. So let's look at how this 
would play out if they're applying for medical assistance. So um, the, again, uh, their assets get to be situated like this. Bob gets to keep 3,000. Ruth keeps 128,640. Ruth keeps the house. The spend down of their assets, remember their total assets are 300,000. That was cash, surrender value of life insurance plus their investments equal 300,000. Their exempt assets are the 3,000 plus 128. So we're subtracting that 131 and that leaves 168,360. That is what we call spend down. That's the amount of assets they are over um, in order to be eligible. Okay, so if they went out and did an, a, a screening or if Bob moved into the nursing home and they applied for medical assistance, they would be denied eligibility, not necessarily on clinical need, but because they're over assets, they have more assets than are allowable. Now, from an income perspective, Bob has higher income, he would keep $104 for something called a personal needs allowance and whatever amount he pays for his Medicare supplement each month. And then he would be able to give some of his income to Ruth in my example. Why? Because she is a low income. $1,000 a month is not enough. She's allowed to get a minimum of 2031 total which means that Bob is allowed to give her some of his monthly income to make sure that she has adequate income to support her needs. That's how it works when Bob is in a nursing home, okay? Mary Francis, um, we have another yeah. question that's come in. Okay. Yep, um, maybe it's further into the slide deck, but will you be discussing ways to protect your assets, uh, such as a trust? I will, we will, we will get there. Great. We are current with our questions. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, so we're still on example one, nursing home. They've got this excess of 168,360. What can they do with it? Well, one would be pay for care, right? Option one, pay privately until you spend down to the 128 for Ruth and the 3,000 for Bob. Um, other options would include um, permissible ways to spend down assets, include making any impair, um, improvements or repairs to the house. Remember, Ruth is going to live in that South Minneapolis home. Maybe there's concrete work. Maybe that's got the original you know, furnace in there. Those are permissible ways to, to reduce assets and put um, some of that 168 into an exempt or protected asset. Maybe Ruth is driving you know, her 2004 Buick and it's time to trade that in and upgrade to a new vehicle. That would be a permissible reduction of assets. Of course, prepaying the funerals um, would be advisable. Um, th there's this idea of the Medicaid qualifying annuity. So we have 168,000. Um, we would probably be evaluating here. Um, could we? Could we fund a Medicaid qualifying annuity for Ruth? There are some advanced strategies here where let's say they said, well, we have two kids and we'd really like to um, give some of that property to them. Is there a way that we can do that permissibly? There is an advanced planning strategy where if, if somebody like Bob and Ruth had an excess of 170,000 and they wanted to make a partial gift to their children, they know there's gonna be a penalty there's a way to do that properly using a gift to the children and an annuity to cover the resulting period of ineligibility. Um, that is often referred to as uh, reverse half loaf, transfer apply deny. Those are sort of the um, colloquial terms used to describe an advanced planning strategy. Um, that is something that you would not want to attempt on your own, and you would really need to have some specific legal guidance before undertaking any use of an annuity um, as it relates to a Medicaid strategy. Um, but what we're touching on here is that idea that um, there are these options out there that allow for some opportunity to protect assets. In general, in my example, if Bob, say, is at a $10,000 a month worth of care, 
making gifts are it's generally going to be a no although if they're if you're looking at this reverse half loaf type strategy there may be some um, opportunity for gifting there um, you know sometimes when people have a larger spend down we're looking at something called five-year planning where there are some structured gifts into a family trust um, with the idea that um, the Bob and Ruth of my example would pay privately for at least five years. Um, so you can see the spend down or advanced planning options um, really depend on the circumstances of an individual family, including the availability of income, the excess assets, the cost of care, and also the tolerance or value that a family might see in pursuing that type of planning. So there's almost never a one size fits all, um, but there are lots of different options that could be evaluated to help a family arrive at, you know, what long-term care strategy is appropriate for our situation. Um, so let's take a look at example number two, assisted living. Remember, we're not in the nursing home now, this is community-based care. Community-based care implies medical assistance for elderly waiver as a reimbursement source. We have the reimbursement for services and a separate um, you know, housing um, support uh, issue. So here, same assets, right? We have the house worth 400,000, cash and investments at 250, life insurance, et cetera. But this is not a skilled level of care. Bob needs assisted living memory care. Um, so let's look at the difference here. Bob still keeps 3,000, Ruth still keeps 128,640, she still keeps the house. We still have the same amount of spend down, okay? Still have the same amount of spend down. Um, here, Bob uh, will keep 104 plus the amount to cover his Medicare supplement. So far, everything looks the same. However, when we get to the allocation of income, um, here is where we see a different result. Um, Bob's income is above a certain threshold, which means that he's going to be, um, that, that Ruth, Ruth, even though she'll be eligible for an income allocation, she's going to be expected to make a contribution towards room and board for Bob of about $904 per month. So there's a difference if it's nursing home, she doesn't have that excess contribution for room and board. And the example here, um, she's going to have an excess obligation each month to help contribute to room and board for Bob. So um, again, a difference between what the availability of income would look like because he's in assisted living versus a nursing home, okay? Um, let's look at another example here. Um, we've got a different asset level. So the house is still the same, but here our available assets are only 120,000 made up of cash and investments of 70, life insurance 50,000, same income. Okay, so let's look at what the result looks like. No spend down. This is a situation where Bob is immediately eligible. Why? Because the, the available assets are below 131,640. So that 131,640 is a bright line standard. If the family is below that in available assets, um, then they would be immediately eligible and there's no reduction of assets necessary. There are some additional tips that I might recommend to a family in this situation, including um, dealing with the title of the house and making some changes to the well spouse's estate plan, um, potentially beneficiary designations. In any event, that's not something that I would recommend you do without talking to your attorney, um, but just recognizing that even though they're immediately eligible for medical assistance, there are some additional administrative steps that would be best practice that, that should be considered here. Um, so we touched on long-term care insurance at the outset when we were looking at our roadmap of um, topics we were going to discuss and cover today. So long-term care insurance is a privately sold product. Um, some employers offer it as an employer-sponsored benefit. Um, typically that's a good opportunity to get a lower cost premium and participate in a larger risk pool. 
Um, but the idea here is Bob and Ruth, let's say they're in their 80s and Bob's got his advancing dementia and Ruth has already had a fall. If they don't have long-term care insurance already, there's no way they're gonna qualify for it now. So this is something they would have had to have invested in years prior. And if they have it, then of course I would be telling them we, we need to have a full up-to-date copy of your policy because we wanna understand and know what does the policy cover or maybe what does it not cover. Um, Long-term care insurance is regulated by the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, we have something called uh, the Long-Term Care Partnership Program, which means that certain long-term care policies, if somebody buys a qualifying partnership policy and that policy pays for long-term care, you then, and then even after they've, the, the patient has exhausted the long-term care policy benefit, needs to go on medical assistance, that person can shield up to 300,000 of assets um, because they had a qualifying partnership policy that covered um, their care up to that level. So if you have a long-term care insurance policy and you're not sure whether it's a partnership qualifying policy, it would be, that would be an important thing to know as part of your planning for long-term care um, and something that um, either an insurance professional or an, um, you know, an elder law attorney might be able to help you assess whether or not your policy meets partnership criteria. Um, in long-term care insurance, um, Christy, if you could jump to the next slide, it's really, if you're using, if you have a policy that you intend to, I have no idea what those lines are. <laughs> Does anybody else see that? <laughs> um, so if you have a policy that you are intending to be part of your long-term care um, plan or budget, you really want to understand a few key things like what is the elimination period? That's the period um, after which you make a claim on the policy that you're qualified to receive coverage, but you have to pay privately. Typically it's something like 60, 90, or 180 days. So you make the claim on the policy, you're eligible for coverage, but you are expected to pay through the elimination period. And after you get through the elimination period, then the provider will start um, offering the benefit, the reimbursement. Um, the inflation rider, we'd also wanna know, does that policy have an inflation rider? What that means is if you purchased the policy 10 years ago, it either had what's called simple or compound inflation. It means that the benefit goes up each year on the anniversary date of the policy. We'd really want to know that because if you originally bought a $100 benefit and it had a 5% compound annual inflation rider, that benefit pool would be a lot bigger um, 10 years later. We also look at uh, what's the facility coverage? You know, what type of coverage um, do we have um, under the policy? keeping in mind that um, in Minnesota, we have some laws that, uh, consumer protection laws that um, limit uh, the insurance company's ability to say, um, this is a nursing home only policy. And since you're in an assisted living, we don't provide any coverage. So if you find yourself in that circumstance, you definitely wanna get connected with an attorney that's knowledgeable um, and can help you navigate that claim. So um, in any event, if long-term care is part of your plan, have a copy of the policy, be prepared to understand what's expected if you want to have a successful claims process. Um, that's an area where we're seeing a lot of consumers need some support around making sure they have a successful um, claim. So before I go to our questions, um, my simple closing, medical assistance is really complicated. Um, you know, in our office, we have four attorneys. Um, we study the Medicaid law each week together, Thursday mornings at eight o'clock to, to um, share and discuss the developments um, of what happened with Medicaid over the previous week. You know, cases that are coming down, laws, policy interpretation. It's just a very dynamic area and it's changing. Um, you know, COVID has thrown a couple of curveballs in there as it has with so many things, but it, medical assistance is really um, 
can be quite complex in understanding how does it apply to me. Um, the laws are continually changing and evolving. And I just say that every situation is different. And sometimes people giving basic advice, they may be well intended, but they could actually be causing you some additional financial and legal harm if they don't really understand the consequences um, of the, the advice. And so um, I think about my own family, you know, my mom innocently asking me questions about, you know, a neighbor whose husband is going into the nursing home. And, you know, she asked this basic question about what, or what she thought was a basic question. It always makes me nervous because um, you want to have your own situation evaluated and make sure that these laws and rules are applied to your unique circumstances. So Craig, I am happy to look at these additional questions we have. Sure. Uh, we have, what counts as income? Uh, are social security checks counted? Um, yes, social security is treated as income, as would pensions, um, you know, income from annuities, uh, interest income required minimum distributions. So anything generally that would be considered income, taxable income, if you were going to file, um, you know, a tax return would be treated as income. Also things like um, rent. So if somebody has a rental property or a farm or mineral rights that produce income. So try to think of it like, do I have to report that um, each year to the IRS or would that be treated as income? It, and then it's most likely going to be treated as income for purposes of determining medical assistance eligibility. Okay, uh, a couple more. Are long-term care policies purchased on one state automatically applicable in Minnesota? Um, it depends. I have worked with individuals who were living in you know, other states when they purchased their policy, um, and then they become a resident of the state of Minnesota and try to employ coverage under that policy? Generally, yes. However, where it gets interesting is, um, I'll give you an example. I had a Minnesotan who moved to Arizona for 20 years, purchased a long-term care policy while a resident of the state of Arizona, relocated back to Minnesota, um, was in long-term care, needed to make a claim on the policy. There was a problem in the claims process with the company we were um, that was um, administering the policy and we needed to explore a potential dispute re resolution and because the policy had been issued in the state of Arizona we had to employ um, Arizona law in, in analyzing the coverage under the policy even though the person was in the state of Minnesota. So there are some nuances like that, but in general, if the policy is written with the intention of providing long-term care coverage, it's not going to necessarily only be in the state in which the policy was issued. It gets more into um, enforcement issues where we may see state-to-state -state, um, differences. Great. Could you touch base on retroactive payment for those who are MA pending at a facility? Furthermore the difference for uh, retroactive payments for someone in a long-term care setting versus assisted living facility? So um, good question. Remember back to when I talked about community-based care, assisted living is community-based care. They have opinions. They have yeah. care is long-term care. And those have um, different reactions and the people done that. We have plans for all three and mm -hmm. we're just waiting. Um, it sounds like, oh, there, we might have, okay, had somebody go off of mute. Um, so again, it depends. In skilled nursing care, if somebody applies for medical assistance and their application is pending, in general, they are only obligated to pay what we're, their anticipated um, spend down obligation would be. So if they have a spouse and they're allowed to give an income allocation to the spouse during the MA pending, they'd only be able, they'd only be obligated to make a projected, you know, pro rata payment of their monthly income towards their services. Once they're approved, then the, there would be a retroactive lump sum payment to the provider to make up the difference between what the resident contributed and what the facility is owed under the medical assistance program from the county. That is different with um, a little, and so retroactive payments 
can be made when you're in um, skilled nursing, but you, um, with assisted living, it looks a little different because remember, you have to have that min choice assessment. Um, so it's a little bit fact specific, but if somebody is in assisted living and they have a screening and so to determine clinical need and they've submitted an application and they're pending, um, then the application is pending from the date that it was submitted, assuming they also had the screening in place. If somebody submits an app but doesn't have a screening, they can't go retroactive back. You can only go retroactive back to the date that you had a valid screening. So with assisted living, you know, there are, is a little more nuanced. Um, but if there is a screening, um, it's within the 60 days that an application is submitted, then you can go retro. Um, and again, the resident would just be paying a fractional portion of their, um, whatever their projected monthly spend down would be. Um, and so this is where it gets incredibly frustrating sometimes for providers because, you know, they're waiting for these pending applications to be resolved so that they can continue to get the cash flow. And in the meantime, it can be confusing. What is the contribution that's expected by the resident? In general, it's a limited amount. It's what their anticipated spend down obligation would be. Um, okay. Uh, there is another question, Mary Frances. Uh, okay. Does it make financial sense if a person owns a cabin in Wisconsin and a home in Minnesota to put the house in one spouse's name and the cabin in the others? So um, not enough information there to make a general recommendation. Um, those are the types of questions that I think a uh, a good attorney could sit down and assess and understand your individual situation and make a recommendation, but I can't make a carte blanche recommendation on that because um, you know it, it's really, really individually dependent. So I will say this, that um, you know, skilled attorneys that work in this area and work on advising people with long-term care um, would be addressing those types of questions and helping people understand the consequences of, um, you know, title to a property in one spouse's name versus both and, and so on. Okay. Uh, another question that just popped in, are monthly expenses reviewed prior to eligibility? Um, Yes, um, although in medical assistance, there, um, I didn't get in uh, depth in this, but when, if you think about Bob and Ruth, and Ruth is going to live at home and Bob's going to go in for care, um, there are certain standard utility uh, um, numbers that the county uses for everyone, and then there are other variable expenses that will be looked at on an individual basis. An example would be, housing related expenses, like if somebody's living in a co-op and they have a monthly um, contribution um, that, and that's higher, let's say it's $1,200 a month versus somebody living in a home with the mortgage that's paid off, their housing related expenses are going to be different. So there are certain expenses that are evaluated on a case by case basis. Um, a lot of times people will ask me, are they gonna ask for five years of my bank records and look through all of my bank records? Um, not generally, however, they have the right to do that. And what's happening now in Minnesota is when you apply for medical assistance, they use something called AVS, Asset Verification System, where if you are applying for medical assistance, you have to consent to having your social security number skip traced and they're gonna be looking for um, information related to um, your financial life that would be tied to your social security number. So of course, bank accounts, investments, anything like that would be tied to your social. So um, are they looking at monthly expenses? Yes, um, although the way that they take that information in and you know, is um, it, it there are certain utility allotments that everybody gets the same, you know, amount for, for certain utilities and others are evaluated individually. Okay. And then we have time for one more here. Uh, very similar in, um, to one of the upper questions. Um, are monthly expenses reviewed prior to eligibility 
How does home mortgage payment matter? So um, as I touched on just a moment ago, in, if somebody has a mortgage and their shelter expenses are a lot higher, um, it, particularly in the case where there are two spouses and the ill spouse has higher income, the fact that the well spouse is going to have high shelter expenses may um, make that person eligible to receive more of the marital income because their shelter expenses are higher. So having a mortgage payment may mean that in my example, Ruth gets more of Bob's income each month because her shelter expenses are high. So that's how that would factor in to allocation of income between the spouses. All right, I, I think that I, wraps I it up. I did want to go back to one sure. question um, regarding, uh, will you discuss ways to protect assets such as a trust? I want to say that um, the use of irrevocable trusts, irrevocable Medicaid trusts is not recognized under Minnesota law. And so again, back to my Bob and Ruth example, if Bob and Ruth six years ago set up a trust and they irrevocably assigned their, their Brainerd cabin into the trust, but they reserved the right to use it, but they gave it away to this irrevocable trust, but they still went up there and used it and paid the taxes that type of irrevocable trust is, uh, we have a specific state statute that just disregards the fact that they gave up ownership and control. And so if you are being advised to use an irrevocable trust, you really need to be careful. Um, there has been some litigation um, related to this. Um, I'm the chair of a group called Minnesota NALA, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. I chair our public policy committee. And that specific statute dealing with the, um, the disregard of irrevocable trust, we're the only state out of 50 states that have a state law that, that limit the use of that type of trust. And our group is actively, actively lobbying against that to have it um, change. We got some good traction at the legislature before COVID hit. Um, but if, as an example, if a family owns a farm and puts the farm into an irrevocable trust to try and preserve it for future generations, that trust would not be recognized as a valid trust and that particular family, that entire million dollar farm would be considered an available asset, potentially. So, um, you know, it, it's a very, um, uh, it's something to be very careful. If you're using trust and you're be advi being advised about trust, make sure you're working with an elder law attorney that really knows the law in this area. Because we've had some people come to us having worked with outstate attorneys or, or other attorneys that thought that type of trust was permissible. Be very careful. Mary Francis, do you have time for one more? I do. All right. Long-term dementia party had promised her son that he would receive her paid off condo. Title to the condo was never changed. Son refuses to move out in order to sell the condo. Are there any options available outside of evicting the son? Caretaker exemption option has been discounted. Okay, so if we don't have a two-year caregiver exemption, um, then it, if, the, if the owner has moved out and is in need of uh, or it says son refuses to move out. No, I don't. I mean, it sounds like that's an eviction situation. If if that person needs the equity and the the asset to pay for care, it may be while this is happening where they have to go through the eviction, it could be deemed an unavailable asset. And so if somebody has run out of money and this is their asset, but remember that unavailable means there's some legal reason I can't get at the equity to pay for my care that might be a situation where it wouldn't impede the person's ability to apply for medical assistance, but ultimately, you know, how do you get the son out is the question. And in general, if that's his home, there may need to be an eviction proceeding in order for the owner to get um, control and be able to sell. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Thank, thank you, Mary Frances. Again, wonderful information. Really appreciate your time today. Excited to have you back next uh, or in two weeks um, to talk about VA benefits. Um, if that is something you're interested in and have not signed up, please go and do that. Uh, handouts and CEU certificates will be emailed within 48 hours. If for some reason you don't receive them, please email me and I'll make sure you get them. Um, but thanks again for joining us and have a great day. There is something special about Cassia, a spirit you feel everywhere in our communities. I am compassion. I am integrity. Yo soy la unidad. I am unity. I am collaboration. I am innovation. I am stewardship. I am respect. I am excellence. I am Cassia. I am Cassia. I am Cassia. We, we are, are Cassia. Cassia. We are Cassia. We are an extension of your family. In the same way, we treat you as an extension of ours. We are here to be caregiver, companion, chaplain, housekeeper, nurse, so you can be the daughter, son, grandchild, spouse your loved one needs. This is the spirit of compassion you'll find everywhere at Cassia. To us is a mission. Technology can heal, and we are working towards state of the art, but technology cannot care. We all love a beautiful facility, but the warmth a building gives its occupants doesn't replace the warmth of a human touch. Our focus at Cassia is on the dignity, health, well-being and spiritual care of senior adults. At the heart of excellence that sets a Cassia community apart is a staff working for a purpose larger than themselves. Caregivers who value the lives our residents have lived and bring value to all that comes next as their life story continues. Independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, transitional care, memory care, adult day, home care, hospice care, spiritual care. Our range of housing and care options is wide because we know the need is great. Our tradition of providing excellent care has been the work of generations. The name Cassia is new in senior services. When Augustana Care and Elam Care came together in 2018, we chose a name from biblical times to signify our faith tradition. It's an ancient word that once meant servant's heart. Today, it stands for our goal of unmatched care and service. We invite you to visit our communities Experience for yourself the full life a spirit of compassion makes possible. Cassia, an Augustana Elam affiliation, serving all by following one.